I own this land. I own, I own what's here. Why do I have to ask them whether they give me permission to do something? If I have to ask them for permission, that tells me that they own it and I'm leasing it in some manner. Yeah, you wonder if George Washington really had that kind of a problem when uh, he uh, looked at the cherry tree and he says, gosh, if I ch chop down that cherry tree, I'll have the whole uh, board of aldermen on my butt. He's like looking at me and I'm like, no, I didn't get any permission. I don't need permission. I said, look at my backyard. I said, what do you see? He says, well, there's woods back there. I says, all right, how far do they go back? He says, I don't know. I said, well, let's start at 400 feet. I said, do you think I need permission because trees are at 45 degree angles after the storm to uh, basically make things safe again back there? That I have to do a write up on every freaking tree that's uh, been blown at an angle uh, and take it down? Uh, because some of them are very dangerous, and uh, do you think I need to get a, a, anybody's permission for that? Well, uh, and it's like kind of humming, humming, humming. And, and what, what it really boiled down to is they're from the city, and they're so used to everything being so regulated, they can't, they can't basically wipe their ass without using the proper toilet paper. Well, now that's, that's true. You are absolutely correct. I mean, it's, it's uh, what do you call it, um, there, there's a feeling of, um, gosh, I can't find the word, it's security when you have over-oppressive government. Okay, um, yes. But, you see, what's happened is it's become ingrained. And this is where the real problem lies. It's become ingrained within our system that we have an over-oppressive system government or otherwise and uh, I'm making some adjustments here so if it sounds overly harsh let me know uh, in terms of the audio because I'm making adjustments in order to uh, accommodate uh, how I'm talking at the moment and how far I am from the microphone uh, anyway yes everybody is, is getting so used to the fact that uh, they can't do anything without some prior permission or otherwise, from the town, or, or whoever claims their self to be an authority, and do it. They can't. They just can't. Because it's like, oh, I have to get a permit to do this, and I have to ask for permission to do this. And I think when I was, uh, my wife and I were in Carlstadt, we were renting it, we were renting a house, and, uh, there was a tree in the front yard that was very problematic. I shouldn't say front yard. Uh, we'll call it uh, between the road and the sidewalk. And so she, I, I told the wife, I says, we need to cut this down. This is very problematic. Or oh, you can't. And they're like, what do you mean I can't? Well, uh, the, the town won't allow you to cut anything down or do otherwise unless you get permission. I said, are you crapping me? And she's like, no, no, I've lived here all my life, and uh, and we can't do that. I'm like, okay, all right, I'll leave it alone. I said, but uh, it's very dangerous in the position it's in. Well, one day we had one of them torrential rain pours that you know, dropped about four or five inches of rain, and that tree fell over, which <laughs> you could tell it was going to do just from uh, the off balance that it was in with how the uh, trunk and the branches rose and everything else, this tree was in a dangerous, very precarious position. And it fell. And luckily it stopped at one point with its branch about two feet deep in the ground, the one branch that went vertical, or excuse me, horizontal for a ways. Uh, between that branch and the uh, steel bar on the fence holding it in position it missed a pair of motorcycles in the yard which were covered uh, by less than a foot and I remember when I got home from work that day and uh, there's a couple fire trucks in the front yard not in the front yard but uh, parked in front of the place and I parked the car 
and I went to go in the house, and they're like, you can't go in there. So I'm like, it's my house. I, I, this is my place. I live here. Well, you can't go in there. It's dangerous. And I looked at the fireman. I said, I'm going in there. I said, not only am I going in there, I'm going to come out the side door, and I'm going to take a look and see if the motorcycles have been hit. Oh, you're not allowed to do that, sir. We'll stop you. I said, no, the hell you won't. I said, grab one of your dudes that has, has motorcycles, and uh, he can escort me. I said, but I'm going to do it. And it's 50 cents for the rest of the story? They thought they had the authority to stop me on my own property. I, th I thought you were going to charge 50, 50 cents for the rest of the story. I'm not charging anything. It's just like, seriously, I, I guess where I, I was born and raised, it's like that attitude. It's like, dudes, are you serious? Come on. Who, who, the here, who here has motorcycles? Well, what's under the tarp, sir? So you see the first one here? That's the 78 Suzuki GS1000E in mint condition and with, a, with a tarp over it, including the base section on it uh, that keeps it fully uh, weather enclosed. So the second one is a full dresser Harley. I said, you damn well better believe I'm going to go out and check and make sure that they haven't been hit. Well, now, did you finally make an insurance claim on this deal? Well, the, the damage, here, here's the damage. Here's the sum total of the damage. A horizontal pipe, because I, I don't care if there's a hole in the ground. That, that, shit, man. Okay, there's some compressed earth under there. All right, I don't care. Throw in some sand and a little topsoil over it and a few seeds of grass and the whole thing's all covered up and... And by the end of next year, uh, nobody even knows anything happened. The only damage that occurred uh, on the property turned out to be that the uh, horizontal uh, pipe that, uh, that that held the chain link fence in place properly was bent. And now, was it my pro was my was not prime property? We were renting the place essentially, leasing it, whatever, whichever way you want to look at it. So it was, my, was not my property. So did we uh, need to file an insurance claim with where my bikes hit? No. The uh, tree sat inches above them. And the firemen were like, well, we got to cut this tree and we got to do this and that. I says, I'm going I'm to, and I looked at him, I says, I'm going to clue you in right now. You know, I just checked out, the, you know, I said, I'm going to check out the bikes. And after I checked them out, it was like, and they're like, a gas. Okay, he's underneath that brain, you know, that whole tree thing is hung up on that uh, that uh, horizontal section of the fence. And uh, this is so unsafe, blah, blah, blah. I was like, shut up, guys, shut, just shut up. I checked out the bikes. They were unscathed. And so like I looked at them afterward. I came out back out, and I said, look, if there's any damage on that bike or either one of them, it's going to be because, because of you two guys, or not you two, but it's going to be because uh, you guys did something wrong. Now, granted, you may want to cut that tree down, and I looked at him and I said, and by the way, I wanted to get rid of this tree about six months ago due to this particular situation uh, because it was so off balanced. But no, the town wouldn't allow it. Uh, so... You guys are going to be responsible, or the town is going to be responsible, if either of those bikes are damaged. Oh boy, man, you're, you're headed for jail term there. You, you can't threaten local government. I guess I was brought up wrong. I was brought up in Pennsylvania. They got a whole different attitude than New York or New Jersey. Was that Transylvania? Not just Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. <laughs> oh, well, you know, it's like the power company here. I've got a couple of dead trees that are hanging at about a 45 degree angle over the power lines. Now, they will not cut those, 
Uh, but the, if uh, a limb falls on their power line, they will cut it off if it hangs there. But here are two dead trees hanging over their power line. So I guess they'll wait till one of those trees drops right on the power line and, you know, takes the power line out before they'll act on it. Oh, that has to do with previous lawsuits because we got too damn many. And I, and I, I don't mean to disparage the lawyers because they, they have a place in society. But we just have too damn many of them. And, uh, that's because of all the litigation that has occurred in the past on stupid, stupid shit. Roger. Well, I mean, they're self-employed, I guess, aren't they? Well, in a way, most attorneys are. Uh, I guess yeah, I could say, well, no, there's corporate attorneys, and they're not self-employed. And you have uh, the ones that work for uh, uh, private groups, which may be a partner uh, or not. But the partners are definitely self-employed. And then you have the singular attorneys that hang their plaque outside their door. And they may be on Main Street or not, as the case may be. And they have their plaque out there. And they just do general attorney stuff and, uh, and, and usually cost the least. But they're still a hell of better, hell of better than going for a public defender, which some people have done in the utmost dire circumstances. And it's like, dude... You went for a public defender uh, trying to defend a pedophile charge and uh, you're complaining about now the results of it? <sighs> Your common sense left you. That, that's a common problem, is the lack of common sense. Uh, in no uncertain terms, common sense has... Uh, has become very uncommon. It's not common, it's uncommon sense now. Yeah, it's a uh, choice of words, I guess it is. So uh, all these uh, weather patterns that tend to be uh, uh, coming across your uh, location up there, uh, have you had any uh, antenna discrepancies because of that? No, I've got antenna discrepancies for something I have yet to discover. And I'm still, you know, kind of my bad on it because I have a VNA that I can basically put at the feed point and uh, it'll Bluetooth the measurements to a computer below or somewhere in the vicinity and I've yet to do that. But I, my antenna discrepancies are not weather related at the moment. I, even though I have a cage dipole, illegal antenna, even though, <laughs> even though I have that, it's... Uh, I'll tell you what, damn well sturdy. Uh, when you think about the tension necessary to take a, a three-quarter inch diameter ceramic uh, insulator and pull it apart, I'm talking about tension, dis you know, tensional, you know, tensile destruction, where you actually rip that uh, three-quarter inch uh, ceramic fired insulator apart. Uh, the amount of force necessary for that. Uh, think of them as uh, think of them as force fuses uh, in the antenna system, because uh, that's that's how they are, are, are acting now. Uh, I've had three of them pop, literally, from tensile strength, and uh, just basically being sheared in half. Roger. Well, you might uh, think about using what's called egg insulators. And these are insulators where the wire goes all the way across uh, and back uh, on both sides. So it's pulling against the middle as opposed to pulling against the ends. Well, that's compressive strength. Compressive strength is a whole different matter. And uh, I don't know, honestly, I don't know what uh, I'd have to look up. I, well, I can't. I can't look it up. I can't. I don't know the actual material used in the ceramic. So, without knowing uh, the material properties of the ceramic, I can't can't do anything regarding the tensile strength, nor the compressive strength, for that matter. But generally, uh, under compression, things are much stronger than under uh, tension.
products. Roger. Well, you know, those regular insulators, they just got holes in the ends. So when push comes to shove, uh, they just pull the ends out, you know. But these egg insulators, they're pulling against a piece in the middle. So they're about five times stronger. No, oh, they're not pulling against it. They're compressing it. So it's, what is the compression strength? Strong enough. <laughs> times greater. I would I would think of course I don't own any of those. I have the ones that pull out the ends. Well let's see, I popped three and that's probably low. I probably pop more than that. Uh, they literally and I talk when you talk about a split, it's like you look at them and it's like uh, it's not like somebody hit them uh, with a chisel or otherwise where they kind of just cracked right through and you can pull them apart. Uh, this is a true tens tensile uh, uh, rupture that occurred. T the true temp tensile rupture that split them. Well, I put a few things on the antenna because it's like my son would just, you know, after a storm, uh, and I'm talking major storm, not minor storms, uh, major, major, major storms. And I would go out with, you know, I could see it right here on the S S me, uh, SW, excuse me, SWR, the SWR, whatever you call it, meter right away. Uh, I'd go out and take a look at it. And it's like I'd uh, knock on my son's bed. He'd get up, and I said, like, we're going outside. We're going to be putting the antenna back up. And it's like, Dad, it's 2 a.m. I said, yep, it's 2 a.m. Uh, get on your clothes, your shoes, uh, grab the ladder with me. We're going to put it up against the tree. We'll have the flashlights. We're putting the antenna back up. Uh, I have to remount the insul a new insulator and bring it back up. He look at me like, Dad, you are nuts. Yeah, he knows better than that. You can't do that unless you got four foot of snow. We'd get it back up and look at him. I'd thank him profusely. He'd be happy because it's like, oh, okay, this is one of those 20 minute jobs, not not the, okay, this will only take five minutes, but it takes two hour jobs. Uh, this is one of those, uh, uh, I don't know how long it's going to take, but it takes only 15 minutes because what? You have to climb the tree, uh, basically pull the rope back into position after I uh, put a new insulator in place. Well, that's been that's been corrected. I have a uh, dead man's loop uh, for no other you know for no other explanation what it might be an actual dead man, dead man's loop on uh, on all all three sections of the antenna from the center and both both sides. Uh, so if either of the insulators or you know any of the three insulators split in half, which they've done. Uh, the dead man's loop will capture it, uh, allow us to lower it properly, replace things. I can do this all myself, pull it back into place, and everything's copacetic. We're fine. We can go on. Uh, it can be done in five minutes now. Uh, in the past, we had to bring the ladder up to the tree, lower the whole system because, well, it's split. Well, it's still hanging up there. Okay, this has to be lowered properly. And pull back in, you know, after it's tied back up, uh, pull back into place. Uh, now it's like, even if it splits, the whole system is intact. Uh, it's not going to be an issue. Roger. Uh, this is uh, Kilo Charlie 9 Victor, Kilo Victor. And uh, I'm just curious now, what page on the ARRL handbook is uh, Dead Man's Loop on there? I don't know. I just made that up. This is one of those... If I can't think of the real name of it, I'll make up a name. I got you. <laughs> it's a DOA. DOA? Uh, dead on arrival. I don't know. I bet I, I, I'm trying to visualize how this loop... Uh, is it a loop that goes... Uh, 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 under the insulator, so in case the insulator breaks, there's still connectivity there? No, no. On the rope side, I have another piece of rope tied, okay? And I have about uh, three or four feet of rope, okay? A quarter inch nylon, which is, uh, what's this tensile strength? 
thousands of pounds, a thousand pounds. And you're not going to pull that apart, uh, you know. And it's black, so it's uh, UV proof, supposedly a uh, quarter inch uh, nylon rope. And I've got that tied on the one side on the rope side, and I have coming over to the other side where the wire is, I also have it tied. Why? Well, because if it splits in the fashion it has been splitting, uh, even if it slides along the rope, the insulator is going to catch it, or it's going to, you know, because of the way that the knot is made on either side, it's not going to uh, come off. I can lower it because of the, you know, ten the remaining tension on the rope, replace the insulator, and uh, pull it back up into position. Before when it's split, I'd have a piece uh, of the insulator dangling up in the tree after the pulley that wouldn't lower. It just would not lower because the uh, weight of the rope from that height in the tree on uh, the side coming down was much greater than the uh, weight of that little piece of insulator and the uh, 10 or 15 feet of rope that was there. And so, yeah, I could not lower it. So it was like climb the tree, uh, pull it down, take the uh, section of the insulator that's broken off, uh, replace it, and then pull everything back up. That was a bit of a more major hassle. With this loop, I'll call it, what I, which I just dubbed the name Dead Man's Loop, uh, if that insulator splits, it gives about another two or three feet of slack to the uh, antenna, which is generally sufficient. Uh, and it allows the you know insulators to see that insulator to split, and yet allow me to control it from the ground in terms of pulling it down and replacing the insulator. So it's nothing more than a loop of rope, in, in this case nylon quarter inch black nylon, that goes from the rope side uh, underneath the insulator and loops back up and is tied to the. Uh, uh, the wire, which it will slide along, and I got no problems with that because all the brakes so far have been somewhat centric, central to the insulator, and as such, uh, uh, they're, they're sufficient to keep the thing as an intact section, which now has another two or three feet of slack in it. W3JMD. KC9VKV. Now, call me stupid, but uh, I just take the rope and tie it to the antenna and don't have the insulator is that you know that that works fairly well I mean the rope's an insulator so what do you need an insulator for in most you know purposes I don't uh, which serves that uh, yeah, okay uh, I'll see if I can say this uh, without uh, stuttering, slurring, or otherwise uh, Babylonianizing the uh, words. The, the insulator serves as a nice way of allowing a uh, structure, in this case the insulator, to give a nice curve to the, both the wire side, you know, coming through the insulator, it's not a uh, quarter inch diameter, it's uh, three quarter inch or thereabouts gives it a little bit more uh, width to it uh, for the wire and on the rope side uh, it gives a convenient tie point also uh, and so between them there's uh, a ridged insulator what does that do? Well the ridges actually increase the uh, uh, surface length to from one side to the other which increases the uh, uh, voltage resistance from one side to the other, but I got nylon rope, so why should I worry? Well, generally I don't. And with the three-foot loop there, uh, that impedes no matter how waterlogged or soaked or how many times birds, birds have pooped on it to give electrolytes in it and make it possibly conductive, uh, it's going to be far greater than uh, that of the antenna. And not change the SWR, W3JMD. KC9 VKV. So, what you're saying is if I don't use the insulator at the end, I am running an illegal antenna. No, no, because you can tune it and everything without the insulator. And by the way, uh, 
there are some excellent insulators out there that I probably, though I have tested them and found them to be extremely structurally sound, I probably should be using them. Uh, and that is, you know, you know you, the two-liter soda bottles. Um, are you, you're familiar with a two-liter soda bottle, right? Uh, Roger, Roger. Okay, if you cut that uh, top just below the wide section, uh, where the bottle cap, when you screw it on, stops at. If you cut just below that wide section and uh, loop your rope through that on one side and the wire through it on the other, that is one hell of a strong insulator. I'm trying to visualize this now, but it's not quite coming to me. I wish I, could, I was better with words. I'm, I'm grasping that we cut this uh, two-liter bottle somewhere around the neck area. Is that a Roger? Uh, a page that uh, goes through all this. That's why he said, hold it, I'm going to record things. Okay, if you take the bottle top, okay, the top of the bottle, it goes about one inch down. There's a flange there, just below that flange where when you screw on that little metal bottle cap on the two meter, on the, excuse me, the two liter uh, bottle, uh, just below that, if you if you look, there's a, a somewhat of a wider flange, so it goes out about a quarter of an inch. It uh, tapers down to about uh, 16th, somewhere between a 32nd and a 16th of an inch, and then goes back in. If you cut right below that, Razor blade, knife, that doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't have to be super clean. Helps if it is. Uh, so you don't, you know, have some abrasive situation with the rope or otherwise. So you have this uh, cylinder. The cylinder, which has a, a somewhat half, half witted uh, circular spirals on it, so a bottle cap can screw onto it. Um, so you have this little cylinder, it's about three-quarter inch to an inch long. It's uh, actually high-density polyethylene of some sort. And uh, if you loop the rope from one side, just basically throw it through that cylinder, you know, cylindrical hole, throw it through there, and uh, tie it. Uh, you got, okay, you got one side done. What's the other side? Get into this uh, bottle top section. Uh, it's uh, like I said, this little cylinder, and then uh, you know tie it off. However you do uh, the ends of a dipole, you have yourself one very strong insulator. I'll, I'll tell you what, that is one very strong insulator. It will tend to stretch before it breaks, and that's another beauty of it. That, uh, that polyethylene has an HDP high density polyethylene. I think that's what it's made of. Uh, will stretch long before it uh, starts to split, crack, or break. Roger that. Well, I mean, I, I guess it doesn't matter what uh, flavor the uh, two-liter bottle is. I mean, they all work uh, pretty much the same. I'm just trying to visualize this two liter bottle hanging up in the air people are driving by saying what's he got that bottle hanging in the air for oh no there's no bottle there in fact i'm not even sure they would even recognize the fact that you have the very top section which is, uh, which is the top one inch of the bottle so if you, if you have a you know if you were to go and you have one in the refrigerator for instance Roger, Roger, Jim. Uh, uh, Mother Nature gave you back your 20 decibels of signal. Your signal's much up. Uh, and there might have been a breaker in there. I'm not sure if there's another station. Uh, go ahead. Uh, WA5NG. I didn't mean to break up y'all's so I just wanted to see where you fellas were at. Uh, 
yeah, um, Jim or James, uh, there's a group that comes in here. I just looked at the clock, and it's like, oops. Uh, there's a group that comes in here, and they usually start about 5 a.m. Eastern uh, time. And I'm noticing this thing, 7 after 5, and the, the guy from the Five Land there that just uh, jumped in, he uh, he's basically serving a reminder, like, dudes, uh, we usually get here about 5 a.m. and uh, hold our net. And I apologize to you, sir. Uh, not meant. Uh, it's me sitting here without a clock right in front of me, uh, babbling on and on and on. Well, Jim, uh, your Mother Nature gave you back your 20 decibels, so we talked we talked through the low point back into a good signal. So uh, let's uh, we'll uh, leave on a high note and continue this uh, later on. Uh, uh, good to talk at you. And I'll post this. Uh, I might cut out or not. I'm not sure. We were in the in the noise there for a little bit of the conversation, but uh, I shall uh, post it on my YouTube in some form or another in the next couple of days. If you go to YouTube and do a call letter search, Kilo Charlie 9 Victor Kilo Victor, Kilo Charlie 9 Victor Kilo Victor, uh, we'll be at the top of the page in the list one. We have about 80 now. This will probably be 81. Be up towards the top just below Art Bell. So uh, with that, we'll say threes and uh, let the uh, network uh, resume their, uh, or uh, start their uh, broadcast. Roger, Roger. No problem, no problem. I think I'm on your, uh, I think I'm on some of your uh, stuff on YouTube already in the uh, past. Uh, actually, I know I am. I, I, I went to your web page and then looked. It's like, oops, I'm on the, I'm on the YouTube. Oh no! <laughs> I don't care. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'm trying to be above board and, uh, and reasonable here. <laughs> So, uh, yes, uh, KC9, Victor Kilo Victor, and uh, the YouTube stuff, yes. No issues. Uh, yeah, Jim, you have yourself a great evening. Uh, hopefully a very fine and happy weekend. And we're going to try and do the same and have a great weekend. And I will turn it over to the uh, group. It's not a net. I've been informed of that and told that several times after I kept saying net. And somebody came on and said, no, it, it's not a net, it's a group. That's ah, all right. I don't care if it's a group or a net. Uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's uh, individuals that use the frequency at a certain time, and they've been doing that uh, in, ad infinitum, and... Uh, and uh, they enjoy uh, their own, you know, each other's company. And uh, uh, the guys in Five Land and elsewhere, the frequency is now yours. It's 10 after nine, uh, 5 a.m. and seven threes to all. And a great Saturday to everyone, including the group that gets on here in the morning and makes 3860 one hell of a frequency. W3JMD. Good night, James. And good night, world. W3JMD clear. Roger, Roger. Catch you later. Casey 9VKV clear.